All Eyes Visual Hall VRP is a portable vision testing platform that includes visual fields, acuity, color vision testing, pupillometry, and extraocular motility. The visual leverages virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and augmented technologies to enable eye care providers to test for and monitor common eye diseases. Visit alleyes.com for more information. Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromycel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and Micromycel technology. With more screen usage and indoor time, myopia, also known as nearsightedness, is increasing and getting worse in children. Now, certified eye doctors can prescribe my sight one day. The first and only FDA approved soft contact lens to slow myopia progression in age appropriate children. Visit coopervision.com to find a Brilliant Futures certified eye doctor near you. Do your patients know what presbyopia is? There are people who are afraid of the press. Have you talked to your patients about multifocal contact lenses? I've heard the bifocal, but not right, multifocal. Not multifocal. Do you need help with your multifocal strategy? Learn more at the conclusion of this episode. Welcome back to part two of my interview with Dr. Brianna Rue. In this episode, Dr. Rue shares her experience on treating common eye issues. If you're new here and you like our interviews, press like, subscribe, share, and hit the bell. Also, please leave comments. Be sure to watch our full-length documentary, Open Your Eyes, on Amazon Prime, Apple TV, iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube Movies and Shows. And tune in to our brand new radio show, Saturday mornings at 9 a.m. Central Time on AM 1280, The Patriot. So, okay, let's do, talk about, you brought up visual acuity. What is visual acuity? That's kind of the next part of the eye exam. Uh, what is it? So we all love to say the term, you know, like I'm 20, 20, or I'm 420, or I'm 30, 20. Like everyone, mm -hmm. it's the, vis the first number is always 20, mm -hmm. right? That is the distance, it's 20 feet that we're checking your vision. Now there's a slash after it. The next number is how small of a letter that you can see. We visually are capable of seeing 2020, 2015 as a size letter, even 2010, right? Animals, you know, eagles are like, you probably know this better than me, like are even better than that, right? So now if I'm 20 at 20 feet slash 400, that's the big E. So I can't see anything below that. So that gives us a starting point to what you're seeing. And then that's actually, we have guidelines to fo follow. If I can't make a patient see 2020, so a 20 size letter at 20 feet, I got to look and I have to have an explanation in my chart of why I can't get you to see normal. Let's go to the next thing, color vision. Uh, usually color vision is normal, but in 8% of males, it's abnormal. And supposedly in a half percent of females, it's abnormal. Although I've been practicing for a long time. I haven't seen an abnormal in a half percent of females and it's inherited. It's an X link and a linked, a recessive uh, gene passed down from the mom. So why is color vision important? Color vision is checking a couple of things. So we also can look for disease really early if someone's color vision isn't there. So we do check color vision and that's where you're actually tracing numbers or you're telling somebody that you're seeing numbers or there's even little tiles that you're putting in place according to color. So if your child is colorblind, it's okay, right? They see a world through a different lens than you do. And so they act, it's okay. But it also helps us catch other things that aren't normal. So if your color vision is decreased, we can be looking for things like multiple sclerosis, an optic nerve problem, a brain functionality problem, or something else going on in that optical system. And it's important for parents to bring their kids in. I mean, for the whole exam, but color vision is an important part because a lot of learning perception 
and color coding is done th is done through learning in school. So if there is a color vision uh, issue, you know, and there's different grades of color vision issues. It's not that you you're totally colorblind. It's you know you're deficient in different ways, but it's an important thing to know because there are different strategies that the parent could use with their children to help them. There's also different strategies and there's also different, um, as the child gets older, different professions that limit you. So you've got to have good color vision to go and be a pilot or be on like a boat driver or something else, right? So there's different things that if your kid is gung-ho to be this, make sure we're setting them up for success. I'm not going to like squash anybody's dream when they're six, right? And they're colorblind. That's going to change. I'm not saying that we do that, but you got to know these things in the back of your head on how to help your child be the best that they can be. The next thing you really need a trained professional to do. It's not really something that a technician could do. I mean, they could try, but this is something that really is an art and a skill is the cover test. Mm -hmm. If you could talk to us about that. So this is where the cover test, where we're actually looking for ocular alignment. And so we'll have you look at a, a far point, far away down the room. So sometimes you have them look at a light or a letter. And we're actually, again, looking at how your eyes are aligned together and also individually. This is where we look for eye turns or if there's something that comes and goes throughout the day that can actually derail learning. So the cover test, we look at it both far away and up close to look at how your eyes are teaming together. You know, and, and we are, and we talked about before with the color vision test of someone is has exophoria, convergence, insufficiency. They could have esophoria where they convert, excuse me, converging their eyes too, too close, and that could cause headaches and 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 you know you might need glasses for that. So and sometimes one eye could be a little bit higher than the other, and you know we could use eye therapy or we could use prism to kind of help these people. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So let's talk about the next part: extraocular muscles. You know, you know we we think about this. This is quick. It's usually most of the time it's normal, but sometimes it's not normal. And, you know, with some of these remote exams, these are, these are tests that are being skipped. What are, why are we looking at the six extraocular muscles and what does it tell us? Correct. So we, in each eye, you have six muscles attached to it and each muscle is responsible for different things. The, they also, what we call yoke, they move in the same direction too. And so they're all, when I'm looking to the right, I'm using one muscle in one eye and the other muscle, another muscle in another eye. When I look to the left, same thing. When I look up, I'm using two muscles. When I look down, I'm losing two muscles. When I rotate my head, I'm using more muscles. And so your eyes, they're, your, your um, eye muscles are actually the most active muscles in your body. They're constantly working to keep your eyes straight. So if one of those muscles doesn't work, we call that a nerve. They're all innervated by nerves. And so there's certain corneal nerves that actually go to each individual muscle. So if you present with double vision, most likely that's a cranial nerve issue. Or if you have one of the muscles not working properly and you come in with an eye turn, we have to figure out where we potentially we could do muscle surgery. So that's another thing that, again, we're looking for little things that are off that you can only see through actually being there in front of the patient. Yeah, so innovated by the cranial nerves, not the corneal nerves. So oh, sorry, like, cranial nerves, sorry. So, and, and if there's a paralysis of one of the muscles or a weakness, we call it ophthalmoplegia. And if somebody has ophthalmoplegia where they can't move their eyes the way they could, the way they need to, it could be indicative of certain diseases. If you could talk a little bit about that. You may know a neuro-ophthalmologist that really knows a lot about this. So I'm married to a neuro-ophthalmologist <laughs> who deals with this all the time. So some of the issues that we run into could be thyroid eye disease related. It could actually be a weakness, like Dr. Gelb had said, of one of the corneal nerve or cranial nerve. Why is he corneal? Cranial nerves. Um, the other thing, the big one is diabetes, right? So if you've got a patient that comes in with double vision, 
And that would be the symptom, right? Hey, doc, I'm not seeing single in this when I'm looking at something or when I'm looking out. The main one here is diabetes. So you're actually, that nerve has become hypoxic or doesn't have enough oxygen going to it. And now you have damage to that nerve. So those are some of the main things that we're looking for when you have double vision. And I mean, we could, God forbid, it could be a brain tumor, you know, something like that. So we want, we want, we're going to be looking for saccades. So from looking from one point to another point, mm -hmm. emergences, whether the eye could go in and out, in and out, and how smooth the eyes are going. Even a, even migraines could sometimes affect eye movements. Correct. Yeah. And so again, we're not only just looking how your eyes are, like, can you follow my finger? I'm looking what Dr. Gelb was saying on, do you have bumpiness, right? So I just saw last week an 87 year old where she actually has, I was doing her eye movements and her eyes are actually beating along. She has down gaze nystagmus. Well, now that actually where it goes to is to her back of her brain. She's got a cognitive decrease in her cerebellum, right? So all of this is related to how your eyes move. And that's what we're looking for when we're actually tracking your eyes. How quickly do you get out there? Can you get out all of the way? Can you look all the way up? Can you look all of the way down? So there's so much when, like we do these tests really quick because we have that trained eye to know what we're looking for, but that's, it takes years to get that training. And you talked about the stagmus or the shaky eyes. That, be, could, that could be something that you could be born with and it could be acquired. And now, of course, if it's acquired, now we, you have to start thinking about stroke or, you know, MS or some kind of trauma. You know, there, there are neurological issues that could cause, cause this. And, and like you said, it really has to be done through a trained professional. It's not something that is very easily done through a technician on a, on a remote eye exam or through, you know, or, th or through uh, your, or your cell phone. Correct. Exactly. So let's talk about the next part, the pupils. <laughs> I'm sure you know a lot about pupils. You know, like I said, you know, a neuro-ophthalmologist. Let's talk about pupils. Yeah. So pupils, we're looking for if both of them are restricting, if both of them are opening, and then they actually are subject to one another, right? And so when we're shining that bright light in your eyes, we're looking for all of these as reactions. And so if you have a decreased reaction in one pupil, again, where that's going to map in your brain is going to be a different, potentially a different disease. For instance, if you come in and your pupil is really, really large and you have an eye turn problem, that's an ocular emergency. You are going to the ER to rule out a lot of different potential diagnoses that are very bad. So this all, again, points back to if you have an eye issue, we've got to figure out what it is. So pupils, again, we're looking into a lot of different stuff on the neurological pathways here on what's going on with the, the connection from your eye to your brain. Yeah, because it could be an aneurysm, it could be a tumor. I mean, there are certain medications that affect the pupils. I know a lot of times I'm sure, you know, uh, primary care will send the patient in and they're on uh, something like Oxytrol, uh, an anticholinergic for overactive bladder. And because they're worried about angle closure glaucoma that could cause the pupil to dilate. You know, so there's a lot of things that affect the pupil and the pupil could tell us a lot of things. Yes, it can. And, you know, and there's new tests now that actually can measure the pupil, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know, very, very particularly, so we could tell whether or not there's a pupil, pupil damage, but, but the, the physician looking at the pupil, that really needs to be done with a trained eye. Yes, it does. We're looking for a lot there. And again, a lot of these tests seem so simple on what we're doing, because we can do them very quickly. But this is all the things that we're checking off our list as we go through this eye exam, right? Right now, just on this talk, we've talked about many, many things. That list that we've already gone through, we're already evaluated that you don't have a hundred things, right? Very quickly. So let's look at let's talk about the lids and the lashes. You know, I know <laughs> you're you're very interested in, in dry eye and and we could tell a lot by looking at the lashes and and sometimes around the eye too, looking at the Ed Nexer around the eye, the lids uh, for, you know, little cancers around the eye. 
Yeah, so you've got the ability to diagnose basal cell, squamous cell. Um, if eyelashes are missing, that is a clear sign that something may be going on. Then you have your little oil glands or these little right where your eyelash meets the base of your eyelid. Now, like the big thing right now are these big fake eyelashes, right? Or that's like, you just blinked and gave me like this whoosh of air, right? These things are disgusting. And people are paying a lot of money to keep these eyelashes on them. But right at the base are these little mites and they like to live there. And so it's important, just like we brush and floss our teeth, we've got to wash around our eyelids. And so what happens is these little kind of creatures can sneak into your little glands right there. That's where you can end up with a sty or one of those little red bumps. You can end up with really bad dry eye. And then that's attacking your surface of your eye and that can lead to more problems. So your eyelids are actually really important, right? When we blink, we're actually getting rid of all of that debris and then washing it out. So if our eyelids aren't clean and we're just blinking all of that stuff in, we're going to end up with not a happy surface. So how do you think the best way is to clean the eyelids, lashes, eyebrows? So I don't know about you. It tends to be my male patients <laughs> that aren't the cleanest when it comes, right? Women are actually very good because we do wash our face very rigorously because we wear eye makeup and we got to get it off. So it's really typically the men that aren't so good, but it's just taking a good facial cleanser and just spending some time around your eyelids and your eyelashes. And you can also take a little, we have things like hypochloric acid and stuff like that that's really gentle on the structures of the eye. Hypochloric acid, right? What did I say? Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to, um, you can use things like that that your doctor can prescribe. Um, there's little wipes that you can get that have tea tree oil in them and um, coconut oil and stuff like that. So just make sure that something is prescribed by your doctor on what you're going to do. Because sometimes you don't even need this. Just a little washing goes a long way. So if you're watching this, you don't want to put hypochlorous yeah. on your eyes. But the hypochlorous, uh, like a company makes one called Ad Advanova, uh, you could use to spray on your eye, you know, prescribed by your eye doctor, of course. And to help click to help kill some of the bacteria, there are other companies that make it as well. I know Bruda has one, and a lot of companies have it. And then you have these eye these pads that are made to keep the eyelids clean. That's what I do. I use the pads, and I close my eyes really tight, and I clean the debris off my eyelashes, and and then my eye feels really good afterwards. Yeah. You know, you clean you get that those stuff tears off. moving get those tears moving. And I never, you know, my eyes don't get dry just to, just by keeping your eyes clean and drinking a lot of water. Uh, it helps, helps you from, it lowers your risk of dry eye. So that brings us to the next thing, evaluating the tear film. Yeah. So your tear film, it's made up of three, three really technical areas here. We have a mucus layer, that makes up a little bit. You have the water layer that makes up about 90% of it. And you have this oil layer that slicks over the top of the tears from actually letting them evaporate. And so if any of these systems are off, whether you're not making enough tears or your oil layer is not working, you're gonna end up with something that us as eye doctors like to call dry eye. A lot of patients though, they say, doc, I don't have dry eye. My eyes are tearing all the time, right? Well, it's just a fancy term to say, okay, well, your oil glands, right? Every time we blink, we pull this little oil layer out. If you think of this oil layer and that you have 30 glands on the bottom and 30 glands on the top, every time you blink, you pull it out. That slicks over the tears and it prevents them from evaporating. If you're not blinking, these glands, they get clogged, then they get inflamed, and then they start to die. And that leads to very bad, hard to treat dry eye. So most of us are functionally making a lot of tears, but then they're evaporating instantly. And so I can't make enough tears to overcome that evaporation. So that's what we call evaporative dry eye. So again, you've got to look at the function of the tears on what's happening. And we do that by using certain dyes to look at different areas and show us what kind of dry eye you have so we can put you on the proper treatment. And how easy is that to do through a remote eye exam or an online refraction to look at the tears? 
So it's interesting, you know, a lot of us will do a prescription check first, and then we actually put you in front of what we call a slit lamp or a big high defined microscope. So if I've got a patient that's not giving me really clear answers, I'll go straight into this eye health check and realize they don't have any tears. So the refraction piece that we're trying to pull out of all of this for the benefit of the patient is really doing the patient a disservice. So you have to look at all of this again, the whole ocular system. MacU Health, your science born and tested solutions for visual performance, macular degeneration, and dry eye syndrome. New products coming soon. Embrace the science. The All Eyes Visual Hall VRP is a portable vision testing platform that includes visual fields, acuity, color vision testing, pupillometry, and extraocular motility. The visual leverages virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and augmented technologies to enable eye care providers to test for and monitor common eye diseases. Visit alleyes.com for more information. Let's move on to the cornea. Yeah. What is the cornea? What is aberometry, topography? Why are those tests important? So your cornea is the very first part of your eye. It's the dome shape of the eye. When you wear contact lenses, that's actually what you're draping the contact lens over. And it has a lot of refracting power to it. And so what Dr. Gelb is talking about is when we're looking at topography, I'm looking essentially at the power of your cornea. This could lead where we're looking for things like keratoconus or pellucid marginal degeneration. So again, the cornea has five layers to it. We're looking at all of these layers as a function of one another to see if there's any diseases going on there. And so that, again, it's the first refracting surface or second refractive surface after your tear film that we're looking at. So your doctor is going to do a scan of your cornea to make sure that it's healthy. And then we fit contact lenses and glasses prescriptions off of those numbers. And a lot of us are using aberometry now. What is that? So aberometry, you're, again, looking at that front surface here or the front surface of the cornea and from all five layers together. So I don't have a clear explanation of aberometry. Maybe you can help me out there, Dr. Gill. Oh, so yeah. So we're, we're just looking at really for distortion of the, of the cornea and aberrations, really. Yeah. You know, the cornea sometimes has different aberrations and... We could correct the prescription really good, but if you happen to fall out of the normal curve or you're, you've overslept with your, you slept with a contact lens that you shouldn't have, your eye becomes distorted and then you're getting all these, these, the, this, the, the, the eye becomes distorted and you're, you're getting halos and things that are difficult to correct and certain contact lenses are better than others when you have uh, your your cornea has uh, these ir irregularities. Correct. So think of an astigmatism as one of these aberrations, right? We can correct for that because you have two focal points. When you get into these higher order, they call higher order aberrations, it's where an image is kind of smeared, right? So we, again, when we're doing our testing, we can actually, with the technology, show the patient essentially what they're seeing without you describing to me what you're seeing because I can actually look at it together. You know, some people have a condition called keratoconus where their cornea gets distorted and they wind up with these aberrations. And if you're doing aberrometry, I do aberrometry on all my patients and it's very obvious when somebody has these corneal distortions mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, it helps us to be able to give a better correction to the patient, although it's a little bit more difficult. Let's go to the anterior chamber, the angle. Yeah. So the angle of the eye. So you have your cornea, you have the colored part of your iris, and then think of this as 360 degrees, right? So your eye is constantly making fluid. And it's not related to everybody. This is where kind of pressure comes in. Everybody's like, well, my blood pressure is high. Does that affect my eye pressure? These are totally two different things. So your eye is constantly making fluid and it has to be drained out. The angle of your eye is where all of the fluid is drained out. And so if your drain isn't working to the eye, that's where we have things like glaucoma come about. Or if the drain is clogged or actually shut off, that can actually make your eye pressure skyrocket. And we would have to do something like a laser procedure 
to get that actually unclogged. So that's again, before anybody puts any dilating drops in your eyes, because the iris is going right into that little section. If you dilate a patient that you shouldn't, the pressure can actually skyrocket. So again, when we're looking at all these things, that's what we're looking at before we even put a drop in your eye. And looking at the angle is takes a lot of skill. It's, it, it, you need a, really a trained professional to be able to look at it. Yes. Because if it's a very narrow angle and certain nationalities, people that are a little bit smaller and have smaller eyes, their eyes tend to be crunched together and their, their cornea and the iris tend to be closer to each other. And you're not getting this angle to let the fluid out, but it's getting very close. And I know, you know, with the po patient population I deal with, we see a lot of people with, with very narrow angles and a lot of them get, have to get a little puncture in the, in, in the iris to be able to open that up and cure it so they're not at risk for, uh, for an angle closure glaucoma attack. You know, there's been some studies recently or too many of these little PIs being done. And, uh, but when you look at it, if you are unlucky enough to have an angle closure and it could have been cured by this very simple procedure, I think most of the time, if you need it, it it's well worth it because if you get an angle closure glaucoma attack, it, 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 it is, could be catastrophic. And it's very painful. And painful, exactly. So let's go to intraocular pressure. Mm -hmm. What is that and why is that important? Yeah, so intraocular pressure, again, that's the puff test that some doctors do. We also have multiple other ways that we can measure it, but we're measuring how much fluid is in your eye. So again, we're checking at this point for glaucoma in a very easy manner. So again, glaucoma is when either you're making too much fluid, so your eye pressure is going to be high, or the drain isn't allowing the fluid to drain out. Typically, it's a combination of both. And so this is, again, where we're looking at the pressure to the back of the eye. If you got too much of it, too much of anything is probably a bad thing in most scenarios. Mm -hmm. In this case, it is. And so that's what we're looking at to make sure that your pressure is normal. And if it is elevated, we got to figure out what type of elevation that you have and how bad. So let's go to the vitreous now. So we're going to look at the jelly of the eye. And why is it important to look at that? So the jelly of our eye, so it makes up around 90% of our eye is this chamber, which we call the vitreous chamber. And so the jelly, which is where some people start to see those floaters, right? I've got a couple right here. We've just named them, right? And they follow you. So that's if you look at like a bright wall or out in the sun, you can start to see the little jelly. Remember, function of the light. The light comes in through your pupil, goes through this jelly. And so if I have something in front of here, I'm going to actually make a shadow onto the retina. That's what my brain is going to interpret as something. The jelly is attached to the eye at the back of the eye of the retina in certain spots. So if the jelly detaches itself, it sometimes can take the retina with it. That's a very bad thing. So when you start to see flashes of light or an increase of floaters or a meteor shower of floaters, you instantly, you don't want to go to Dr. Google because you might really scare yourself. Call your eye doctor. Let's get you in. Let's evaluate it. And it is never something that you should wait on. So the jelly, important. It doesn't really play much of a function, more as a, an annoyance as we get older because um, it does get heavier over time, which is why you start to see a little more floaters, but it does play an important function for the retina. And a lot of times we look at the jelly to see if there's pigment in there with the slit lamp. And that's a technique that we use to see. If we see pigment, we call it a Schaefer sign. Uh, or tobacco dust, because that's kind of what it looks like. And that could mean that there's a retinal tear that it, that's happened. And we, the, the eye doctor really has to look and make sure there is no retinal tear. And those little particles will wind up in the jelly of the eye. Exactly. And then again, that's, we have to dilate you. And these are all the functions where you would see those flashes of light or an increase in floaters. And there's been time and time again, where people are like, yeah, I've been seeing this for six weeks not thinking anything of it, and there's a significant problem. So you always want to get checked out if something is new in your vision. Your brain is telling you something. You need to take action. 
And next is one of the most exciting parts of the body and most interesting parts of the body to look at because we can learn so much from the retina. So tell us a little bit about the retina, about OCT, and you know why it's so interesting to look at. Yeah, so the retina, again, is that fine layer that covers the whole back of the eye, and that's where the light enters the eye, and then you have that, um, it, goes, it travels through the optic nerve to your brain to interpret what you saw. So with the retina, you also have the blood vessels. The blood vessels are on top of the retina, and we can see a lot by these blood vessels. So if you're diabetic, or if you're hypertensive, or if you have high cholesterol or other things going on, that's why your doctor wants you to get an eye exam. We can see so much in your eye without cutting you open. So we can actually visually see all of these micro blood vessels and what's happening. So you can diagnose strokes. You can diagnose diabetes without patients even knowing that they're diabetic. You can diagnose hypertension, high cholesterol, and many other things by just looking at the retina. You can also have growths back there. Macular degeneration is what we're looking for back there. So lots of things in the back of the eye. And that's where these images really come in handy. So when we do dilate you, we're looking with that bright light. Remember, it's a dark hole in there. We got to illuminate it and we got to see what's going on. And so that's where also pictures come in really handy um, to look at the retina and show patients what we're seeing because it is a very fun part of the eye exam. So the next is the optic nerve. So the eye is so complex. There's so many different parts to the eye. As you see, we're going through the different parts. Tell us about the optic nerve. So your optic nerve, it takes all this visual information, processes it to the back of your eye. So it goes through all the way to the back of, for your visual cortex. So remember, your eye is front all the way to the back, makes up 60% of really your entire brain is a function of your vision. So the optic nerve, again, that's where we're looking for glaucoma. We can see multiple sclerosis. We can see brain tumors. We can see swelling. So if you have symptoms of like whooshing in your ear or, or um, visual disturbances or fluctuations in your vision, this could be a sign that the pressure in your brain is actually high. And we would see that in your optic nerve. So if the pressure in your brain's high, it's pushing the optic nerve forward, we would actually see that um, during your eye exam. So it's, it serves a lot of purpose. And there's so much good technology to help us look at the optic nerve and look at the retina. And, you know, it's so specialized that there are actually a subspecialty retina specialists, retina vitreal surgeons. That's all they do is they look at the retina and, and try to prevent the retina from going bad so people don't lose their vision. Exactly. Same thing for glaucoma specialists, right? That's right. And, uh, and a neuro-ophthalmologist. And a neuro-ophthalmologist. <laughs> so let's talk about, and we talked a little bit about that, but we, we went through, you know, the complexities of the eye exam and, and, and let's talk about online eye exams or online refractions and how does that fit in? So I'll start. I think that they have a place just as a starting point, but I don't think that anybody here would agree that that's really what a vision exam is about, is about a prescription. That's a starting point for the rest of this. And so you can, again, start there, but realize that, that when you're signing off on all of these things, they're saying you attest that you don't have diabetes, you don't have hypertension, you don't have glaucoma, you don't have this right? They're asking all of these weeder out questions when you may be just rushed because your contact lens prescription expired and you can't get back in for your eye exam. Understand that we're not there to just hold you hostage to these prescriptions. We're a function of the, of the health of your entire body. An optometrist, ophthalmologist, we're a function of all of your care between your primary care, your endocrinologist, anything else that you would need. And so we're a function of the healthcare team that you're implementing. So that's not what those are. And a refraction is only one piece. That prescription that you leave with, that you get to wave around that you're a minus six or whatever, that you have astigmatism, that's only 10% of what we do. 90% of it is making sure that you get to keep your most precious 
thing, which in a lot of us is sight. Just switching gears for a little bit, what piece of advice can you give people at home that are watching the podcast? And we alluded to a little bit of this before to help protect their vision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I look at myself as that visual protector, right? So realize that, again, most more people are in more fear of losing their vision than they are of losing a limb. And so once a year or twice a year, just like you go to the dentist, put this into your care. Just recently, I diagnosed a patient that was saying, I'm having trouble reading, 40 year old, right? Oh God, I just turned 40. Um, presbyopia, having trouble reading, but it was actually more of a function. They actually could not see out here in their peripheral vision, right? We sent them directly to the hospital and they actually had a tumor growing in their brain. So something as little as that can be life-changing for a patient because we caught it so early, all of it was actually um, irreversible. And so the patient actually ended up being able to see again. So it's always important. You're, and you have to be an advocate for yourself. Yes, technology serves a place. I've built a technology company, but it's enabling the doctors to take better care of you and you have to be the one that takes care of yourself. I can lead a horse to water and I can pretty mix make, make them thirsty, but you got to, at the end of the day, be the one to drink. And it's your health care. You alluded to this before. You're a mom of you have two young boys. What are you doing to protect them? Yeah. So again, I used to give parents the benefit of the doubt that it was harder to keep kids entertained than what it is. So, you know, very specifically, when we go out to dinner, we're talking, we're bringing toys, we're involved in them having conversations between me and my husband. Um, it's important that you're with them, right? And if you can't be, just make sure that they know how to play. So you've got to, you've got to offset a lot of what we're doing with online learning and all of these things shoved down their throats. Let them be kids and understand that you're part of that as well. So talk to us, so you brought it up a little bit a while ago about you being a, a technology entrepreneur. Tell us about some of the companies that you started, why you started them, and what they could do to help patients. Yeah, so starting a technology company called Dr. Contact Lens, again, I, I always cared so much about the patient and the patient experience, and I feel a lot of doctors were holding on to this kind of control. But in essence, the patients have to understand they're the ones that control healthcare. And your information is very valuable. And companies out there of the world want that information. And so it's important that as a doctor, when I'm giving you a prescription, that you have access to it. 24 seven, that you're able to order your contact lenses at nine o'clock, that the parameters are right, right? You shouldn't have to lose this piece of paper, wait until I'm open or get one of these refractions and then put all your information, most likely putting it in wrong. These people not authorizing it correctly through the doctor that prescribed it and you ending up with the lenses that I didn't prescribe or see on your eye and evaluate to put your eye health at risk. So this is a functionality of the healthcare team. The patient is the center of this and we serve the patient. And I think that there's a difference there on how most of us take it because we went to school our entire 20s and our 30s. We go into a lot of debt to take care of patients, but we also need the patients to take care of their doctors, which has us kind of in this little kind of cat and mouse game a little bit, I would say. And so again, it's, I'm all about patient empowerment in the right way. So tell us about Technify, a new company that you started. Uh, I didn't know about this. Yeah, so what Techify is doing is it's, it's showing doctor's offices. Again, I need to adapt things to get my staff staying in front of the patients, right? How many times do you go to a doctor and they've got your back to you while they're typing in all of their medical records and they're not using everything that they can. And the staff is trying to do a million tasks. We're all short staffed as it is, right? We're like short on people everywhere across the world. And so 
nobody likes to do mundane tasks. We're only human at the end of the day. So we want to employ things that can better serve us as doctors and help us better serve our patients. And so being this technology entrepreneur, talking to many technology companies, realizing we're all on the same mission, which is to take care of the patient and essentially take care of the doctors. So we have people to take care of us in the future. So it's all of that whole circle of life of healthcare. Well, Dr. Rue, we're very proud of you for all your accomplishments, starting companies and taking care of patients and being such a great eye doctor. If people want to find out more about you, how can they do that? Yeah, so you can visit our website, drcontactlens.com. You can also find me on LinkedIn through Brianna Rue is most likely the best way to get hold of me. And that's R-H-U-E. Um, email, I hate email. <laughs> <laughs> as Dr. Hill probably said. Um, so yeah, those are the best ways to get a hold of me. And then my practice website, westfroweredeyecare.com. Um, and then, then I'm a huge, huge advocate for really this picture of myopian kids that should be a thing of the past. So as we get into that, um, yeah, eye care is a really exciting place and we're taking care of vision at the end of the day. Well, Dr. Ruth, thank you for joining me today. You're a wealth of knowledge. You're a lot of fun to talk to. And this is Dr. Kerry Gelb for Open Your Eyes. We'll see you next time. Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromicell, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and Micromicell technology. The All Eyes Visual All VRP is a portable vision testing platform that includes visual fields, acuity, color vision testing, pupillometry, and extraocular motility. The visual leverages virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and augmented technologies to enable eye care providers to test for and monitor common eye diseases. Visit alleyes.com for more information. Fitting multifocal contact lenses presents a big opportunity to meet patient needs while growing your practice. Alcon is your partner, not only with our innovative portfolio, but through e-learning. Learn to enhance your multifocal strategy today with the Alcon Experience Academy. OIE Broadcasting is the emerging leader in social media. We use scientific entertainment to drive more patients into your office. Visit OIEbroadcasting.com and sign up today. Since I bought Safe For You, my dad makes me clean his boat. It's natural y es un buen producto. Every time I go back to school, my mom always makes sure that I have my Safe For You products. I bring extra and my roommates certainly don't mind. It's a good thing I had Safe For You to clean up after this little guy. When my hands get dry, I like to wash them with Safe For You. And most importantly, the reason why I buy Safe For You is because it's safe for me and you.